Hello, welcome to our online lecture on recognizing early motor delays at the two-month well baby visit. Over the past 25 years, there has been a sharp increase in the number of children who have early motor delays, from 1 in 100 in 1988 to 1 in 40 children today. We created a chorus on detecting early motor delays at the two-month well baby visit so that children affected by these delays get the early therapy services they need to reach their developmental milestones. Throughout this lecture, we will be discussing the importance of tummy time, detecting early motor delays, and what to do if a delay is suspected. I will begin by telling you a little bit about Pathways.org and the many free resources we offer on child development. Pathways.org is a national not-for-profit organization established in 1985 that is dedicated to spreading knowledge about the importance of early detection and intervention for children's motor, sensory, and communication delays. All Pathways.org materials are created under the guidance of our medical roundtable members, comprised of leading physicians, clinicians, and lay advisors who are sensitive to the medical and emotional needs of infants and children with early delays. We have a toll-free parent-answered helpline. Our website was created in 1996 and serves as a resource for both parents and health professionals. We offer a wide range of free digital materials, including handouts and brochures in multiple languages, as well as videos covering a number of topics related to child development. One of our most popular resources is our Assure Baby's Physical Development brochure. Inside the brochure is a growth and development chart that tracks a child's progress in the areas of physical, play, and speech development. There is a column with a list of warning signs that can help a parent identify possible concerns. In hard copy, we have the brochure in English and Spanish. Online, we have it in over 15 languages. As I mentioned, in the last 25 years, there has been a sharp increase in the number of children with an early motor delay. On the slide, we have listed the wide range of conditions that could be classified as a motor delay, anything ranging from low muscle tone to cerebral palsy. Early motor delays can affect a child's ability to meet major milestones, such as grasping, crawling, walking, standing, and talking. There are several reasons for the dramatic rise in early motor delays, an increase in the number of multiple births, an increase in the number of premature births, an increased survival rate of children with cardiac, neurological, and genetic disorders, and changes in post-birth positioning. This presentation will focus on proper post-birth positioning because it's one of the easiest ways to prevent early motor delays. Since the start of the Back to Sleep campaign in 1992, infants are now placed on their back to sleep. This has reduced the incidence of SIDS by over 50%. However, an unintended consequence of this campaign is that babies are missing out on 12 to 15 hours of tummy time per day that they used to get. This, combined with all the infant equipment available to parents, has led to many infants spending excessive amounts of time on their back. This lack of tummy time while awake can lead to a delay in meeting major milestones and conditions like positional torticollis and positional plagiocephaly. It is our hope that children who have these conditions or early motor delays are referred for early intervention services as soon as possible so that every child has the opportunity to reach their fullest potential. Early Intervention is a national service that provides therapy services to children aged 0 to 3 who have developmental delays. Each state runs their own early intervention system. The three main therapy services offered to children through early intervention are physical, occupational, and speech therapy. Some people will ask, why does a baby need occupational therapy if they do not have a job? A child's job is to play. Occupational therapy helps people accomplish activities of daily living. For an adult, these activities might include getting dressed, typing on a keyboard, or cooking dinner. For a baby, this might be playing with blocks or learning how to crawl or walk. Another question we get often is, why does a child need to see a speech therapist if they are not talking? 
Speech therapy is not only important for communication, it also helps children with feeding issues. Often, it is easiest to think of physical therapy pertaining to gross motor, occupational therapy pertaining to fine motor, and speech therapy pertaining to talking, feeding, and swallowing. I would like to show you a brief film about one little boy who went through the early intervention system. His name is Jonathan, and he had a condition called positional torticollis, which is a tilt in the neck because of a shortening in the neck muscle. His positional torticollis was so severe that it began to affect his posture. He was referred for early intervention services to correct his positional torticollis. Here is his story. Meet Jonathan. His story shows us the value of early detection and early intervention. Watch Jonathan in his early physical therapy sessions and see his remarkable progress over time. When Jonathan was born, his tone seemed to be a little looser than I would expect. Uh, having had a child before, I noticed that something was definitely not quite right. Uh, my son really couldn't push up on his arms and lift his head. The three-month milestones were not being met. What Jonathan experienced is a condition called positional torticollis. Torticollis is where one of the muscles in the neck is shortened or constricted, resulting in a tilt of the head to one side. Continuing to sit in this position also impacted Jonathan's posture and motor development as a whole. I was lucky that not only was I an athlete before uh, so that I had things to look for, but I also was a mother before. And I noticed my son was not reaching those milestones. Diane's instincts were correct, and Jonathan began physical therapy at four months. She brought up her concerns about his posture and development with Jonathan's pediatrician, who then referred him to a physical therapist for an evaluation. Goals were set for Jonathan, including stretching his neck muscles, improving his core strength, and developing the skills needed to meet his milestones. An important part of Jonathan's success included a home-based program with increased tummy time and positioning to improve his posture. By six months old, Jonathan's torticollis was greatly improved. It still appeared he had a slight curve in his spine because of his difficulty sitting up straight. Here you see Jonathan at six months old in a therapy session. He is beginning to sit unsupported, one of the main six-month milestones but most of his weight is shifted to his left side, resulting in a slight curve in his spine. His therapist is working on shifting his weight to be balanced in the middle. It is clear it is more difficult for Jonathan to be balanced while sitting with his weight in the middle of his frame. By nine months, Jonathan is able to sit completely independently. He is much stronger than he was at six months, and the curve in his spine is greatly reduced. His head is now held squarely in the middle of his shoulders. Jonathan still has a tendency to keep his weight on his left side. He holds his right arm close to his body to aid in stability while playing. Two months later, Jonathan is able to sit with a straight spine and his weight balanced in the middle. The curve you saw in a six-month video is gone and he can now move freely, reaching for a toy in any direction. When looking at Jonathan's back in these two comparison photos, his progress is clearly remarkable. His core strength and balance are evident from the way he freely uses both arms in the 11th month photo. His parents' original concern about turning his head in both directions is now resolved as Jonathan can explore his environment and interact more freely. Jonathan continued to be monitored by his therapist, though as he got older, his visits became less frequent. As Jonathan learned new skills, he was watched for any signs of reoccurrence. By 26 months, he was discharged. Jonathan is now able to run, jump, climb stairs, and keep up with his friends. He may not have had this chance without the promise of early therapy. I'm very thankful that we had early intervention and uh, we got the treatment. and the differences it's made in my child's life and, and obviously ours. And I know he's off to an incredible start. Jonathan's story is a great example of how early intervention can help. I think it is important to point out that Jonathan began therapy at four months and was discharged at 26 months. It took 22 months to correct his positional torticollis.
Babies grow so quickly that one month in their life is like one year in an adult's life, which is why it is incredibly important to refer a child early if a delay is suspected. Beyond just positional torticollis, many children who spend a lot of time on their back also sometimes develop a condition called positional plagiocephaly, which is when a baby develops a flat spot on the back of their head. Here is a picture of how this condition looks. Some babies require a helmet to correct head shape. These helmets can cost up to $2,500. Many people have to cover this cost out of pocket because a majority of insurance companies consider it a cosmetic problem. Doing tummy time with a baby can help prevent these conditions and save a lot of time and money. With the continued increase in plagiocephaly and the rise in early motor delays, we decided to create a section on our website dedicated to the importance of tummy time. We have common tummy time FAQs, as well as tips and tricks that might help make tummy time easier. We also created a brochure on practicing tummy time from the first day home from the hospital to six months old. Through these efforts, we hope to encourage parents, grandparents, and caregivers to practice tummy time with their baby every day. In 2008, there was a national survey of over 400 pediatric physical and occupational therapists that had an average of 25 years' experience. Two-thirds of them noticed that there had been a rise in the number of children under the age of six months referred for an early motor delay. Of the therapists who noted an increase in referrals, a majority named lack of tummy time as the reason, and 70% said that many parents had little to no understanding of tummy time. Tummy time is critical for building strength in the back, neck, and shoulders, which is needed to meet many of their developmental milestones. In order to help parents make tummy time easy and successful, we created a short film on five essential tummy time moves. Pathways trusted to assure the best for all babies' physical development presents five essential tummy time moves. Tummy time is one of the best and easiest ways to enjoy some time with your newborn. But tummy time is also essential to your baby's optimal physical development. Babies who skip this important step oftentimes experience delays in crawling, walking, and possibly even eating and talking. That's why Pathways suggests you incorporate these five essential moves into your baby's daily routine. Remember, begin tummy time soon after your baby is born. Start with a few minutes, working up to an hour per day in spurts by three months of age. Link tummy time with familiar activities such as diapering, bathing, or even playing. Tummy time should be fun time. Position 1. Tummy to tummy. When your baby is happy, fed, and awake, it's the ideal time to try some tummy time. Here, mom leans back, propped up by a pillow to keep baby angled up slightly. She then positions his tummy against hers. It's important to use your hands to keep baby stable. Even if your newborn isn't lifting his head yet, this position will help him get used to tummy time and help him build and strengthen back and neck muscles. By three months, he should definitely be lifting his head and pushing up on his forearms to try to look around. Position 2. Eye Level Smile Babies love your face and voice. Here, baby is trying hard to lift his head and look at mom. Get down on the same level as your baby. Voices and faces are great motivators. Position yourself in front of your baby to encourage head lifting, and then move your face or a toy side to side to encourage head turning. If your baby consistently prefers one side, take note and bring this up with your pediatrician or healthcare professional. Position 3. Lap Soothe. Here, baby is learning about tummy time with mom. Mom places him across her lap. She can have both knees even, straighten one leg, or raise one leg higher, like mom is doing here, to keep the knee under baby's chest higher. A hand on baby's bottom helps to stabilize and soothe him. Position 4. Tummy Down Carry. The tummy down carry is a good alternative to always carrying your baby upright on your shoulder. Mom is supporting baby with one hand between the legs and under the tummy, 
and the other hand supporting baby's head and shoulders. Here, you can see how mom nestles baby close to her body for additional support. This is a great position for dads to do too. Think about using this when you're carrying the baby from room to room. Every bit of tummy time makes a difference. Position 5. Tummy Minute. Start to incorporate tummy time into your daily routine. For example, every time you change your baby, place him on his tummy for a minute or two. Here, mom positions a rolled up receiving blanket under baby's chest and upper arms so that his chest is propped up. Babies love consistency, and linking diapering and tummy time will definitely remind you to do it, but your baby will also see this as a natural part of diapering. Here, mom is using a mirror to keep baby interested. Babies love faces. So remember, it's important for even newborns to get some freedom of movement on their tummies. Moms, dads, grandparents, and caregivers can start to incorporate these five essential moves into baby's daily routine right away. Begin with just a few minutes a day, a few times a day, from birth and work up to an hour a day in spurts by the time the baby is three months old. The moves and activities mentioned in the film do not require buying expensive equipment and can be done almost anywhere. Babies need responsive attention, observation, and regular opportunities to practice tummy time. It's important to remember that practicing tummy time with a baby not only furthers their physical development, but also builds a bond and supports socialization skills. So now that we have discussed the importance of tummy time, I would like to talk with you a little bit more about early motor delays. As I had mentioned before, there has been a sharp increase in the number of early motor delays over the past 25 years. The majority of severe motor irregularities are detected at birth, but minor delays can become apparent as early as two months of age. So when assessing a child, our hope is that you will focus on the quality and the symmetry of a child's movement and might ask yourself these questions on the slide. We believe in the power of observation and trusting your instincts and the instincts of parents. In order to help detect these early motor delays, we videotaped two little boys, one typically developing and one atypically developing at two, four, and six months of age. And in the next slide, we are going to show you the two-month footage. Marty, the typically developing baby, is one of our employees' babies, and he had been doing tummy time since the day he was brought home from the hospital. Owen is the atypically developing baby, and he was diagnosed with very low tone. In the film, the boys are going to be shown in eight different positions that stem from an evaluation created by a Swiss pediatrician, Dr. Elspeth Kong, who was a pioneer in early intervention. By observing this next film, we hope that you will learn the signs of an early motor delay and use them to distinguish typical from atypical development when assessing a child. Maintaining the head in midline for brief periods is rather typical posture for two-month-olds who are just beginning to show anti-gravity activation of the anterior neck and chest muscles. Although at this age, babies don't stay in a symmetrical position for a long time, Marty is able to locate the object and to track from left to right. He is also showing some anti-gravity movements, lifting his lower extremities off the support surface and beginning to demonstrate reciprocal kicking. He is not able yet to reach for toys, even with the tactile cueing of brushing the object against his hand. We should see this evolve in the next four to six weeks. The tummy muscles are engaged, but not strong enough yet to lift both legs toward the tummy, which is something we should look for by three months. In Owen, we see lower muscle tone and more asymmetrical movement. In his head movements, we see more of a predominance of the head turning to the right and less spontaneous head turning and crossing of midline. He is able to latch on to the visual stimuli, the toy, but he can only track as far as the midline and does not turn his head to the other side. We also see much less lower extremity anti-gravity movement. He does not have the endurance and muscle activation to sustain his posture against gravity.
His movements are slower, and there is not as much variety in how he's moving his arms and legs. We see much less reciprocal kicking and no lifting of the forearms from the table's surface. His movements are much more repetitive, and he has longer periods of inactivity during which he maintains his arms and legs on the support surface. While Marty can't independently roll to the side, he is able to lift his head and upper trunk during a facilitated roll. Initially, he resists the rolling movement, but once he gets into the side-lying position, he shows lateral head righting and the ability to follow through into rolling with head lifted into prone. We also see how Marty demonstrates an integration of the major muscle groups. He can switch from using abdominals during the roll and then recruits neck and back extensors as he completes the roll. Of all the eight positions we will see, Owen looks most competent in sideline, which is why we recommend looking at the baby in more than one position. This position doesn't require him to work as hard against gravity, so he is comfortable here and looks much more symmetrical. His atypical movement is not as obvious in this position, which lets us know that he has possibilities to produce more organized patterns of movement. He can remain in side-lying position without rolling onto his back, but he does this by strongly flexing his hips and knees, increasing his base of support to counter falling backward. Looking at a baby in all eight positions will help professionals best determine which course of action, if any, is needed. Here we see some nice head lifting and extension through the thoracic spine. Marty's hips and knees are moving out of the flexed position into an extended, adducted position, shifting his weight posteriorly toward the pelvis area. This frees his upper body so he can lift his head and upper trunk off the support surface. We can also see little weight shifts from right to left, which he's able to counteract with his abdominals to balance himself, all the while increasing his shoulder girdle strength and changing the sensory input on his arms. As his legs progress out of the flexed newborn position, he is able to lift his trunk and begin using his vision to fix on something in the distance. At this age, you should not expect the elbows to be in line with the shoulders, and he will not yet be reaching for toys. We see that Owen has a much more newborn looking posture, which shifts the weight forward towards the head and shoulder area, making it more difficult for him to lift his head up. He has much more hip and knee flexion than Marty. Once the hips are extended, he will be able to start to lift his head up a little more. It's important to note how changes in the leg position allow the infant to begin developing head and trunk control in the prone position. If Owen does not independently progress to the more extended and abducted legs, he'll be stuck in this position, unable to lift up his head and push up on his arms. His strategy to get any movement is to extend and push up on his legs, which is a non-productive strategy because it doesn't assist him in lifting his head and pushing up on his arms against gravity. When the examiner uses a rattle, Owen gets quiet and listens. But because lifting and turning his head is so difficult when his hips are flexed under him, he is unable to find the auditory stimuli even though he hears it. When the examiner pulls Marty into a sitting position, Marty demonstrates head lag that one would expect in a typically developing two-month-old. We see he is able to engage his neck muscles and bring his head into an upright position without it falling forward, and he sustains head control in midline for 10 to 15 seconds. Typical of a two-month-old, he's not able to assist in the pull to sit but he is able to generate muscle activity in the shoulder and upper arms to stabilize the upper body. 
In sitting, he has extension from his cervical spine through the upper thoracic spine. In Owen, we see scapular abduction rather than scapular adduction. We also see little muscle activity in the upper extremities to assist with shoulder stabilization, which results in Owen's head falling forward onto his chest in the upright position. We see very little activity in the cervical spine. Owen's inability to lift his head and push up on his forearms in the prone position is directly related to his inability to use his shoulder girdle to stabilize his upper trunk during pull to sit. We also see rounding through the cervical spine right down into the lumbar spine. We should be seeing the ability to hold his head upright and stabilize with the scapula, and he should have spinal extension through the cervical and upper thoracic areas. Here we see good alignment of the head with the ear directly over the shoulder. There is good activity of the neck extensors. Marty is able to hold and sustain this posture. We don't see a lot of head turning but this is typical of this age. Marty hasn't yet learned to separate head and trunk extension, but within the next month, this will develop and he will be able to track objects in sitting. We see in supported sitting that the examiner must use more control on the front and back of the trunk to allow Owen to sustain this sitting posture. He has one burst of muscle activity trying to lift his head, but he overshoots the upright position and his head falls forward. This handling position of the examiner is also for safety. The hand on the back is to protect his neck in case he overshoots the upright position. In general, we see he doesn't use his arms. They are very inactive because he lacks shoulder girdle strength to initiate our movement against gravity. In this position, we are looking to see whether the muscles of the neck and trunk can sustain this posture against gravity, and in Marty's case, they can. When he experiments with moving the entire arm away from his body, we can see that the head control is compromised and falls slightly into flexion. Typical of a two-month-old, this indicates he doesn't have enough trunk extension to hold the body against gravity without recruiting the muscles in the shoulder girdle to augment the thoracic extension. Unlike Marty, we can see that in this position, Owen is unable to lift his head or activate his neck and his upper thoracic extensors. Instead, he tries to use the same strategy he did before, which is to move his arms and legs to initiate movement. This is a non-productive strategy. Owen needs to develop his trunk strength. Poor head, neck, and core strength is interfering with competence in several postures. When we tilt the baby forward, he not only sustains, but increases the head and neck extension. He brings one arm forward, but the left arm is flexed and adducted close to the body. This posture helps him increase the spinal extension during the forward tip. Marty is on track in demonstrating fundamental control in this position, so that by six months, he'll be able to extend the head and neck during the forward tip and quickly and easily bring the arms forward to protect himself from contact with the mat. As we tip Owen forward, his inability to lift his head and extend his trunk when being held in horizontal suspension carries over to the forward tipping maneuver. He's unable to generate any head or trunk activity. Without early intervention to develop more trunk strength and optimal movement patterns, it will be highly unlikely that Owen will develop the head and trunk control to allow the mature protective response by six months. 
When placed in supported standing, we see that Marty is able to sustain weight on his lower extremities while the examiner supports him at the trunk. The intermittent bouts of extension and flexion are typical for two months. His head is in line with upper trunk, but he is using shoulder elevation and upper extremities held close to the body to assist him in sustaining his head and trunk posture against gravity. There's a good vertical alignment from head through trunk down to the feet. When Owen is placed in standing, he is only able to sustain pseudo-extension when the examiner is providing maximum support and lifting. He has no intermittent muscle activity to attain or maintain the standing posture. Every time the examiner tries to let him take weight on his feet, he collapses into flexion. The difficulty of talking to a parent about the development of their child should be outweighed by the advantages of referring a child for an additional screening. We encourage all healthcare providers to refer children for an early intervention evaluation as soon as a delay is suspected. Parents will appreciate a proactive approach and feel at ease knowing their child's development is being fully explored and all options are being utilized. It is important that parents feel able to share their concerns. In this next video, you will watch a short role play between a parent and a physician. Keep in mind that although the film is a little bit dated, the information is still very relevant. Notice whether the doctor listens to what the parent is saying and how the doctor attempts to satisfy this parent's concerns. Okay, let's roll Bobby over on his stomach. Okay. You know, doctor, I keep waiting for him to roll over by himself. Well, he'll do that soon enough. But my friend says her son is sitting up already, and, and he's the exact same age as Bobby. Well, Mrs. Pearson, each child develops at his own pace. Well, Bobby's going to be rolling over soon enough, and then you're going to have to worry about him rolling right off the bed. Though the doctor may be right, he did not really answer the mother's concern. It would be more helpful if the doctor responded to her this way. You don't seem too convinced about my reassurances. There's something else you're concerned about? Well, he seems very moody. Hmm. How do you mean? He cries a lot more than other babies I've seen. I don't know when it'll start or even if I can console him. And you know, I'm not the only one who finds him so challenging. Well, let's do this. Bring Bobby back in three weeks instead of the normal three months. And between now and then, I'd like you to keep a diary. Keep track of his moods, his movements, things that might concern you. And that'll help us with our evaluation. If it is decided that intervention is needed, the opportunity has been created for the child to receive therapy two months earlier than if the doctor had waited until the next well baby visit. Sometimes a parent's concerns and a doctor's own observations weren't the doctor recommending more immediate action. You seem awfully concerned about Bobby's development. Well, you know, with my other kids, when they were Bobby's age, they seemed stronger, you know, more able to do things with their arms. His movements were a little stiff. Do you ever have any trouble when you're diapering him? Well, yes, quite often, uh, now that you mention it. Well, I'm not sure any of this indicates a problem. But just to be on the safe side, why don't I refer you to a specialist? He could do a complete exam on Bobby. Great, I'd like that. If this child was developing abnormally, then by really listening to the parent, the health professional has created the opportunity to intercede before the child develops additional abnormal movement patterns. Lastly, when parents and medical professionals know what to look for, recognition of an early motor delay is possible. But missing the cues or deciding to wait and see can contribute to developmental delays. Treatment and prevention can be as easy as more tummy time for babies when awake, or for more complex cases, a baby may need physical, occupational, or speech therapy. If a child and a parent would benefit from a second opinion, they should be referred to a developmental specialist, such as a neurologist, developmental pediatrician, behavioral pediatrician, pediatric occupational or physical therapists, or local early intervention agency. In order to help parents find reliable information, we have created a list of recommended organizations.
Thanks so much for taking the time to learn about Pathways.org, the importance of tummy time, and two-month motor development. If you enjoyed this lecture and would like to learn more about detecting early motor delays, please check out our four- and six-month online lecture series. We would appreciate you taking a moment to complete a short online survey. Your feedback will help us improve our materials and will place you on a list to be notified when future courses like this become available.